from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening and welcome. It's my pleasure as Librarian of Congress to introduce tonight's event featuring our new Witterbinner Fellows. This marks the 15th year of this fellowship uh, in which the library's Poet Laureate, Consultant in Poetry, selects two poets to organize a reading um, in their hometown and then travel here to participate in a reading and recording session. The aim of the fellowship is to encourage poets and poetry and the work of the previous 18 fellows, among them uh, one of these MacArthur so-called genius fellows, Heather McHugh, Pulitzer Prize winner um, Claudia Emerson, and Academy of American Poets Chancellor Naomi uh, Shihab Nye. Uh, this has proved an essential uh, contribution, I think, uh, to the art, and it's a wonderful program, and we're very happy to be associated with it here at the Library of Congress. Now, our two new fellows, uh, Ellis Asikoff and Sheila Black, are a terrific addition to the Witterbinner Fellowship. We look forward to celebrating their work tonight and supporting their future work uh, through this honor. Now, our 18th Poet Laureate, consultant in poetry, Philip Levine, is here to introduce both fellows. Um, Asikoff, whom he calls a true surreal visionary, and Sheila Black, whom he describes as a consummate poet of memory. I think these are wonderful characterizations and typical of the wonderful talent of our current Poet Laureate. Um, he already had an illustrious career before he took on the laureateship last fall. He's the author of more than 20 books of poetry and prose, has received the Pulitzer Prize, two National Book Awards, two National Book Critics Circle Awards, and, and countless other honors. He gave us a truly extraordinary uh, opening of, of our poetry season uh, here at the library and his, his uh, laureateship uh, last fall. Um, he has done remarkable work, not just in his year as laureate, but throughout a long and distinguished career in involving both as the subject of poetry and as the audience that is privileged to listen to it, uh, working people, others whose um, stories and whose imagination and whose physical world in which they work has been elevated through his, his work to uh, true outstanding poetry and has been brought back to many of the same people who are the subjects of these poems. So it's a particular pleasure to have our laureate here with us. Now I also want to welcome Stephen Schwartz, the executive director of the Winterbinner Foundation. Um, Mr. Brenner, the namesake of the foundation, was himself an, uh, uh, an influential early 20th century poet, translator, and I think he would have been proud of this fellowship, uh, the work it does for poetry. So thank you, Stephen, for your great commitment and support. Finally, just let me say a word uh, to, about the Library of Congress and our Poetry and Literature Center. The library is the nation's oldest federal cultural institution it is also the largest repository anywhere of the world's knowledge and because of copyright deposit and many other donations of America's creative cultural um, productivity, if you want to use this term that the economists all love. Um, but it's more than that. It's much to do with the, um, the creative uh, enormous creativity of the American people, which only if you preside over the copyright deposit of the United States, you, you, and you, ever, you venture down there, you discover more and more. And we bring interns here this summer to discover the, the past creative work that has yet to be discovered. Uh, 
Our mission anyhow is to further the progress of knowledge and creativity for the benefit of the American people, people everywhere. Programs like tonight's are showcases for this work. Library is a home for literature, not just our historic readings, but with books, audio, wealth of manuscript collections representing outstanding American novelists and such innovative poets in their time as Walt Whitman, Robert Frost, Edna St. Vincent Millay, and many others who charted the poetic course which continues on with so much vitality today and where we're privileged to hear from our Winterbinner Fellows. So I hope you will visit our website to find out more about the center and the library, our wealth of programs and resources. And let me also say one word about Rob Casper, who's given a tremendous fresh dynamism to our poetic program, brings great experience uh, and enormous energy and enthusiasm as poetry surely deserves and is your presence here uh, tonight to test. So, please join me in welcoming the man who makes all this possible, Stephen Schwartz, to the stage, and with our thanks for this long and fruitful relationship with the Winterbinner Foundation. Mr. Schwartz. Thank you so much, Dr. Bellington. Well, I didn't know I was gonna get up here, but here I am. So. Ladies and gentlemen, I just want to thank you so much for joining us this evening uh, for the 15th year of Witterbinner Fellowships in Poetry at the Library of Congress. It's been a beautiful journey, and I hope that our intention has been accepted in the manner that it was intended, which is just a way of saying thank you to the Library of Congress, a very important institution. Uh, a great bow of respect to the Poet Laureate and the position of Poet Laureate. I think, for my part, that the Poet Laureate is among the most important people in Washington. It represents the voice of the individual, a voice in the crowd, speaking about life's experiences as perceived by the poet. Uh, it's a rare privilege to do what I do, uh, it's not always easy, it's a very humbling experience, as anyone who is familiar with the world of poetry knows. It's a very diverse uh, field, uh, but it's always a privilege to be with and around poets. I know that Witter Binner would be very proud of what's taken place in his name over the past 15 years, and I, I know his spirit hovers above us and wishes us all well in this endeavor. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Well, you'll recognize me immediately <laughs> because I am one of the most important people in the city of Washington. Uh, I, I just learned that. Uh, but I would like to thank Stephen Schwartz and, of course, Dr. Billington for his generous introduction. And Rob, he's here somewhere. There he is. Uh, who's been such a pleasure to work with. And he's made this whole thing terrific. But the most terrific thing, I think, about being the Poet Laureate this year was, was choosing these two poets. Uh, you know, I wasn't on a committee. I didn't have to consult with anyone. Uh, I, an old friend of mine once wrote a poem in which he said, all my decisions are committee decisions. You know? and, and I used to imagine the ego asking the superego, uh, you know, Shall we go out tonight? No, no, don't go out. <laughs> uh, but this, you know, it was up to me, and I did an enormous amount of reading. Uh, and took it seriously, because, uh, because uh, I felt these are two poets that I came across who deserved a hell of a lot more attention than they were getting. And it was up to me. If, to do what I could, and I did what I could. So I'm going to introduce 
Lou Asikoff first. We're doing this alphabetical. Um, and we have A and B. Uh, <laughs> tomorrow we will have a C and D and on through Z. Lou Asikoff. The history of American poetry in my time includes many writers who began strongly, published a book that gathered great attention, prizes, great reviews, and suggested greater work to come. What followed were reading tours featuring the one book, disappointments, and finally, nothing at all. By the age of 40, many of these poets had turned to teaching or editing or banking or carousing, and in the worst cases, to ashes or dust. Thus, it is astonishing to discover a poet who publishes his first book at age 55. And not because for the previous 30 years, 30 different publishers have hoarded the book's attention and finally decided independently to return the manuscript with some variation of the following letter. I put this letter together from letters that I had received. <laughs> Dear poet, you will never know how close you came to being published. <laughs> By Random House, Farrar Strauss, etc. But finally, our committee of famous critics and writers voted to reject your book because it was not timely, experimental, postmodern, or sexy. <laughs> Please think of us again sometime in the future. My guess is Lou Asikoff did something original and old-fashioned. He waited until he had a book he truly believed in. Kafka once wrote that the worst vice a writer can be cursed with is impatience. I'm on Kafka's side. Impatience strangled most of my early poems, and after I learned patience, other weaknesses of character strangled the later ones. <laughs> <laughs> Lou Asikoff was born in Boston in 1939 and grew up on the grounds of two mental hospitals. He wrote me this where he was not a patient, <laughs> nor was he a voyeur. His father was a resident psychiatrist. He attended Bowdoin College, Trinity College, Dublin, and Brandeis University. I do not believe he is in possession of an MFA from Iowa or anywhere else. He has had the temerity to face life without an MFA. <laughs> For 42 years, he taught literature and creative writing at Brooklyn College. His first book, Dreams of Work, or Kaiser's Press, which I think is in Washington, yeah. It was published in 94. His second, also from Kaiser's North Star, appeared in 97. There followed 13 years of patient silence, and then his astonishing Gate of Horn in 2010, quickly followed by his epic-length poem, Freedom Hill, both from Northwestern University Press. This last book, Freedom Hill, is, I believe, the book he prepared all his life to write. It is large in every way. It is the same voice you'll find in the earlier books, but it has become far more resourceful and potent. Asikoff has mastered the art of thinking inside his poems, musing, remembering, asserting, arguing, raging, and laughing. He is able to bring a lifetime of study and experience to enrich his writing. What isn't in this very American book, I ask myself. War, of course, is here because we have been in the business of war for over a century. And so, of course, the two great ones that their space, uh, which have their attendant horrors, uh, the camps and Hiroshima. Technology is here, the technologies of both life and death. The popular arts are here, movies and music and the fine arts of Thelonious Monk, Landowska, Glenn Gould, Art Tatum, Walter Gieseking, and even contemporary painters, Picasso, Frank Stella, and others. And of course, philosophy, Aristotle, Hegel, and especially Herr Heidegger, who insists on returning over and over. Curiously, the one person who rarely appears is Lou Asikoff, for he is the recipient of this book-length monologue. 
What I've neglected to say is what a rip-roaring good read the book is. Let me quote it. As we left the opening, I saw the blotto retro Euro trash genius of the moment staggering out of a silver limo into the blinding Klieg lights of a Belgian film crew who followed him from Dusseldorf to Hiroshima, where he hung, hung pink flags to inflate his art over the radiating ashes of others. In his wake, those long-legged American beauty roses who always get laid at art world soirees. <laughs> Tony Hoagland, in response to Freedom Hill, wrote that Asikoff was, quote, a strange and brilliant poet. Brilliant, yes, but he is not strange. He's absolutely sane and living in a very strange country during a deranged era. And he has reacted to his times exactly as poets when their weapon is only language and, and hilarity and rage that language allows. During the rise of fascism in the land he loved, the great Italian poet Montale wrote, quote, I wanted to wring the neck of eloquence, even at the risk of a counter-eloquence. In his early poem, The Lemon Trees, Montale wrote, listen, the laureled poets stroll only among shrubs with learned names. What I like are streets that end in grassy ditches where boys snatch a few famished eels from drying puddles. Is Lou Asikoff our Montale? I don't know. But if and when he gets the Nobel Prize, as Montale did, we will have our answer. Thank you. I don't think I can say anything after that except that <laughs> uh, your praise of, of Phil and his, of me, uh, leaves me mute. I, I don't believe a word he said. Uh, <laughs> We all know, any honest writer knows how bad he or she is, and uh, we, none of us know how good we are, but I know I'm not that good, I can tell you that. <laughs> uh, lovely to be here, of course, and uh, briefly to, uh, to thank Dr. Billington and the Library of Congress. Uh, in a time like this, uh, an institution that preserves books and values knowledge is something uh, we hold on to. Uh, Rob Casper, who does make everything happen, as I told Dr. Billington, it was Brooklyn and New York's loss when he came to Washington, but I think the nation has gained someone who will uh, keep uh, the poetry and literature center alive and vibrant. I want to thank the Witter Binner Foundation for its ongoing commitment to poetry uh, and its generous funding of the arts. Uh, I can't say enough about Phil. He spent his lifetime in, in his own life and in his work honoring uh, labor and love and liberty, and I bow to him. Uh, I'm also honored to be reading with Sheila Black, whose poems I didn't know uh, before uh, the awards were announced. I, it sounds obscene, but I Googled her, and, uh, and then, and then I, I have her two books in hand, and have uh, very much appreciated their lyric strengths and searing honesty. Uh, finally, the introduction may take all my reading time, but that's fine. Today is a day that uh, moves me especially because my dear colleague and friend Allen Ginsberg died 15 years ago. And while he was never a poet laureate of the United States, he was to me for 30 or 40 years the unacknowledged poet laureate of this country. Uh, so I honor him. He put his queer shoulder to the wheel, as he said, <laughs> and sang the song of these United States. So uh, with that, I'll read a few poems. Um, I hadn't expected to read much from Freedom Hill. The problem is it takes I've 28 minutes to read one, one long section that gives a sense of it. So if you'll forgive me, I'll read, I'll read six or seven minutes from that. But I'll read from uh, the other book, which I don't think is outside, but uh, I'll read poems from that uh, that are largely 
public poems. This seems a civic occasion, so I'll read some of those, and then I'll, I'll read a little bit from Freedom Hill, and then uh, a rather long poem that is about a historian who may well have worked in the Library of Congress. Um, so, uh, the first poem I'll, I'll read is, uh, I don't write public poems, I don't consciously write political poetry as such, but as Phil says, uh, in a time like this, uh, when the Republic is probably long past us and the Empire is, was at its height and who knows what will happen, any concerned citizen has to think again and again about where we are now. Uh, this is a brief poem, it's called The Conquerors, and it was written uh, on the eve of uh, the second invasion of Iraq. The Conquerors. They showed us the white flower of surrender. They showed us the red. They fell down before us at the gates of their city. Terrible to behold, we hovered above them, lords of the air. We promised them the peace that passeth all understanding. We promised them the freedom of the broken knee only the conquered can know. Rumors arose, strange premonitions, a talking fish, a white crow, and news of uprisings in the distant provinces, trouble closer to home. Victims killing victims, a priest cried, who is blameless, the lords of the air who dare not touch earth, those who kill without risking death, Following the itinerary of stars, we returned to our city. There we found they had raised in our absence at the center of the great walled marketplace a statue of Phobos, god of fear. As they fell down before us, perhaps we can be forgiven for asking, having lived so long among strangers, what is there to fear? A lot of my poems, uh, I'm not there. Uh, I'm, I'm as egocentric as anyone, but I have no, not much interest in myself in terms of poetry. I, I'm most myself when I'm somebody else. So I'm going to read poems that uh, what Eliot uh, once thought of calling the wasteland until Pound wisely edited it. Uh, I'm going to do the police and voices. He stole that from Dickens, our mutual friend. So I'll read some poems that are uh, other people. The first one uh, is a Korean woman speaking in the streets of New York, and the poem is called Sparrow. People are predators. They can smell mother love on you just like animals, and they keep away. It protects you even as it eats you alive, the mother with claws. We're wired for distance as a species. That's how we survive. I'm not talking about copycat language of the oppressed, but the speed of language between mother, child, sparrow, sparrow, little sparrow, my brother, my mother's breasts are eyes watching me, watching me. Father was the raven in the white night shirt. He could name anything, a conquistador in snow. His motto, Navigare necesse est. Listen, this island is full of voices. They talk and talk. They put holes in each other. They fill each other with holes. They stand in pools of light, of time. They look like their fathers when they're young, like their mothers as they grow older. Wave the wand and there are pictures in the air I remember the sea and the sky, a triangle, a pyramid beside the sea. I remember the carpenter drew a missing leg, the hypotenuse. Where is the child? The child is the shepherd. Parents are sheep. The man I married was a smooth one. He took me across the waters. Feel your contradiction, he said. 
I need to roll my tongue before I talk to him. His voice is in my head, and he won't listen to what I learned from pain. I'm not lecturing you, I said. It's not in my Buddha nature. But I know what language is. Language is an occupying army, and money, money is a gun. You cash it in for shame and sorrow. After he came back, he attacked me with anger and an army. Verbal abuse, they call it. You're no nomad, I say. You need someone to make your bed, cut your hair. You have to decide where your home is. You can't spend your whole life fixing clocks, changing light bulbs. What I why is it, I say, when men come home from the war, they can't hold their babies? We've reached a point of no return, like a black hole. Call waiting, and it's his crazy brother screaming blue murder from Bellevue, and there's the doctor on the phone. I don't need this, I tell him. I'm not the closest living relative. I learn my language from conquerors, kings, a stranger child walking barefoot in snow, and last month I miss my period. That family, they're all talking people, huffing and puffing. Oh, I know they won't kill me. I have friends who smile as I walk by. They say my name, Sparrow, Little Sparrow. I've been in this country how long? 10 years? I'll read two more of, though one of them is long, so it's not. As a friend of mine once said, uh, there was an interminable poetry reading, and then the blessed word finally came up. Finally, I'm going to read for you a poem called Pain in 33 Parts. So <laughs> I'm not going to do that, but there's a lot of hilarious things in Freedom Hill. I don't take credit for it all because it's, uh, I listened to a great monologuist to whom the book is dedicated for 50 years, and he's still talking. And in part, I, I became his Boswell and transcribed his genius onto the page. But uh, it's in three parts. And the first, the first part is the death of a father. Uh, the second part is uh, set in New York. And Phil read part of that, the art party scene. The third part, he uh, has a stroke and loses language and then slowly regains it. I'll read the part where, uh, just before and as he loses language. Um, so it's, it's part three of Freedom Hill. And it is an American poem in my mind because he has a great American voice. Uh, a prune Danish in one hand, cigarette in the other, my diet book on the desk. I sit here waiting for World War III. When I first read The Poetics of Space, it filled the whole world. Now it shrunk to a still point, an infinitesimal aside on the work I'm doing, fuzzy sets, facetious spheres, and the law and lore of excluded middles. Inside the Florida room, it's intoxicating, the warm air, the weather, what brushes up against me. Here I have memories of water, trees, sky, and the complex relation of my father's illusions, which once and continue to set my illusions in motion. Some of my methods and questions are working to ask of X what is his, her impasse and the way through impasse, and what gap, emptiness, and way to bridge the gap. A stuttering silence into which I mechanically insert validity where people write form as satisfactorily as the flight of a flock of geese toward the excitement of its satisfactions. Not the form of flock or of flockings, but the validity of flock. For diversion, I'm reading a sphincterless philosopher on Hegel and Marx. Beautiful quotations, but dull, dull, a dray horse, and acres and acres of Ashbury plowing my delirium. Like anyone who's toiled in the trenches of use and mention, I'm smart enough to see the limits of my brilliance and have spent a lifetime figuring out the blind spot from G.E. Moore to Bloomsbury, which reminds me, 
your misuse of synchronicity, which I corrected 16 years ago in a letter never mailed to you, should help inspire you to open that cabinet with a left hand of reticence and write me the poem you'd never want me to read. Like my note in your blue book 40 years ago on Hakusai's waves and semicolons in Henry James, the day lilies in my article on Matisse were a lesson to you. Assignments against our failings and the gifts we should renounce from those who whistle by the way. Oh, and here's a moral conundrum for you, mon hypocrite, mon lecteur. Can the slave ever truly betray the master? Meanwhile, I have my own rockets to launch into the spaces and voids of metaphysics, Heidegger's peals of stillness. Two. In the first light of dawn, I woke from Dalmain dreams, the black cat starting his slow migration across my face to a numbing headache, a slight estrangement from myself. Half of me lay in bed while the other half lay just out of reach, extended beyond the plane of feeling. My right side, I soon discovered, was paralyzed. My arm, my leg, my hand. I lifted my left to reach for the phone. I did not know I could not speak. There are pauses here. I, I'll, I'll go quickly, but there easily could be a pause for a few, 20 seconds, but I'll as he comes to consciousness over time. Who are these faces that seem to know me? Speak my name. In the white world, tell me where I am. Where am I? What to do? If I could just reach through to. Wa, wo, world, world. Touch is like bread, the blind man said. Today, Anita brought me snapdragons. While others climbed the purple mountain, rugged rascal, ragged red rocks, stutterers on stones, I stayed below, holding on to the hem of her dress, pronouncing the unpronounceable words, practicing blowing the candle out. Oh, world, world. My W's, R's, L's, I did not speak till I was six. My first utterance was a complete sentence. I do not think I am alone in that respect. The mouth is a wound, open, close. The possibility of passing through and an impasse. Throw out the words to a world Everything collapses around you in gorgeous rubble. Winged rowers of the river of sky. Is this trial and error for search and destroy? I'm training my brain along new pathways, a millimeter at a time, and dragging the offending leg along for good measure, a wet bag of cement. I placed a sign on my wheelchair it's not what you think, saying, me and my IV as they wheeled me by. <laughs> A dismembered remembering that misses the vanishing point. Or, as the mathematician replied to the anesthesiologist, how are you feeling? Number, number. <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> I found my concordance for no in Ulysses. Rescue equals kidnap, kidnap equals rescue, nay, as in no and winnems, quomophobia, whatever could I have meant. Impetus, impetuous. As Maxwell said, the devil's in the details. Know what they almost left out of the first edition of the OED? The verb to be. How's that for forgetting being? The older I get, the less I can control the demons and my misunderstandings and my childhood pain at being misunderstood. When I open up, I'm immense and defenseless. Sweetest sleep seeping 
slippage, blow the candle out. So that's the end of that little section. Do I have time for one more poem? The, the interminable one? I, I didn't look at my watch. Uh, this is dedicated to Raoul Hilberg, a great Holocaust historian who uh, wrote The Destruction of European Jewry and uh, was especially fascinated by uh, the bureaucratic machinery that organized uh, the Holocaust. He was a difficult man. He happened to have gone to Brooklyn College long before I got there as an immigrant student uh, and then went on to teach for many years at the University of Vermont. Uh, he was a difficult, I think, and cantankerous man, not always pleasant to his colleagues. Uh, and while a great Holocaust historian, quite impatient with people who uh, made their living off six million dead. So he was not always one to endorse uh, certain positions about the Holocaust. Uh, I read it because he's a, a great scholar and uh, the words are mine, but they are inspired by a speech he delivered about 15, 18 years ago at Brooklyn College uh, about his, uh, his, uh, his life as a historian. So it's called The Keeper of Records. Paper has been my business for over 50 years. It began in an ex-torpedo factory outside Washington, D.C., a dusty, windowless hive where, as junior archivist, all day I read documents, mountains of captured documents, miles upon miles of paper to be filed in 40,000 linear feet of shelf line after line, page after page, slick blue-gray carbons, crisp white originals, all filed in reverse chronological order until the file is full and then you then put in a box and another file opened, another file filled, and another, and another, and another, and when the box is full, you have a linear foot thousands of documents. They wanted me to read only about the Russians, but I kept my eye on the Jews, recording everything in my head, letter by letter, number by number, line by line, unto the tenth generation, light years away, so that even some minor clerk on the most distant star might weep if he read this evidence of things unseen. From the first, I could feel the force and uncanny precision, the muted music of invisible machinery as water is distilled by the limestone it runs through. Level by level, lock after lock, the whispering genius of civil service that drives the wheel of that great mill pulverizing boulders into gravel, grinding difference down to irreducible sameness. Even then, I knew I must save everything. Everything must be accounted for, down to the last jot and tittle, so that nothing be forgotten, no detail lost under the enormous inertia and weight of trivia. For instance, a simple requisition to repair a damaged rifle stock might be evidence of the most brutal massacre. Scanning 1,000 frames of microfilm, I came across a single line from Mario Paul on the Black Sea, a sentence biblical in its enormous brevity. Today, the security forces executed 8,000 Jews. Everything you want to know in one sentence, except who can imagine what went on? Even imagining seems a kind of obscenity. A man, a woman, a child, 8,000 and all, all standing on the beach before an open grave. Do you really want to see them? It turns out we have witnesses. They were naked, we are told. They were shivering, they asked for mercy, they wept, they pleaded, they cried, they prayed. They were broken down to, how shall I say, their essential elements. 
and who were they facing under that blank sky? Uh, the records, the payroll, allow us to identify them. I could read you the roster of those security forces, the names of the dutiful men now long dead or dying. I could even tell you what uniforms they wore, what insignia, the well-drilled way they responded to orders, the sharp commands and then the spasms, flame, thunder, and smoke, the recoil of silence into silence before it all starts again, round after round after round, rolling down the line like some crazy clockwork, mad mesh of gears, as one by one by one, the bodies, twisted, gesturing, fall into the ditch. Do you really want the details? After all, it's just another day's work. You think it is easy doing what they do. They are breathing heavily, wiping sweat from their eyes. They take a break, give time for the overheated barrels to cool. Someone strikes a match on a boot, lights a cigarette in his cup, trembling hand. Another stares at a gull, wheeling out of the heart of the sun. There's a whimper, a moan. One of them leans over the ditch, raises his rifle, brings it down with a hollow thud on a rotten pumpkin, bald skull. And behind them all, amid blood and smoke, stands a bespectacled man, notebook in hand. What is he doing? Why, he's counting the bodies, accounting for the expense of time, waste of material, bullet after bullet after bullet after bullet, down to the last fennig. Perhaps he's the same man who sits at his desk later that night, wearily writing the requisition for the damaged rifle and typing that perfunctory summary sentence. Today, the security forces. My friends, there are puzzles and mysteries, even in the most complete the most logical accounting, double entries to the god of solitude and locked doors. The railways, for instance, they fascinated me. On the surface, what could be simpler, more routine? So many fennigs per person, per kilometer of track, timetables of trains that will not leave, none of them without passengers, and all of them going one way, one way. Yet it takes great ingenuity and skill to manage that complicated network of railways, the iron web, its stockyards, switching stations, shunts and arteries, its carefully calibrated interconnecting systems of one-way trips spread all across Europe, shuttling back and forth, back and forth from daylight to darkness to daylight again, picking up along the way units of freight invoices, exit visas, each duly noted, numbered, documented, and duplicate, triplicate, Macedonian minor, Viennese music teacher, Taylor from Salonica. Why, it took me 10 years to figure out what the number 33 meant, and years more before I could decipher the color-coded red, green, blue pencil marks. What is saved, what lost? Of course, we make mistakes, we are human, we err. There's a slip of the pen, documents misfiled. We become victim of some vandal allied hand. There are monstrous misinterpretations, false keys, repressed doubts. Still one keeps faith, knowing all the time, because it doesn't mean one thing, doesn't mean it means nothing, knowing all the time that even amid the most casual, the coldest calculations, nothing is lost, nothing wasted, knowing all the time it would take a book 20 times larger than the largest phone book simply to record the names, just the names, of the Jews, the dead Jews. And always the search for that pale, precise man who understands trains, the nightmare bureaucrat who perhaps means no one harm, seeks proper authorization for what was never spelled out, the man with all the strands in his hands, the spider god. For years I shadowed him across Europe, admired in a strange way his fidelity to fact, his demonic attention to detail, the clever unknotting of unforeseen complications, 
as hour after hour he keeps to his schedule. So one continues, the evidence mounts, more than hearsay, witnesses, the statistics tell their own cruel, neutral tale, a tale that would turn a trial lawyer's hair white overnight. And still he sits at his desk, my counterpart, mine shot and brooder. He never moves, he's patient, painstaking. He follows the logic that leads from one thing to another. He never looks up as he plots the long, intricate passage from darkness to light to darkness again. What am I looking for? Codes, ciphers, signals, columns of symbols, random marks on a page. Here's one, gray black dots, an air reconnaissance photo. From this height, you can see the pure geometry of buildings laid out in rows, metal roofs where body heat has melted the snow, and wavering in winter air. The time frame, matched with internal memos, helps us pinpoint that thin worm trail as a group of Jews newly arrived from Posen, marching single file toward the shadow gate, its wisp of smoke, the murder mill at Birkenau. And this one, stamped confidential, let me translate. And this is uh, verbatim. And Hitler, him, uh, pardon me, and Himmler said to them, in this most narrow circle, we must face the hard demands of what is not easily spoken. To make a whole people disappear from the earth, men, women, yes, even children unto the 10th generation, to do the hard thing and remain decent. Who does not know a decent Jew? But now 50 bodies, 500, 5,000, to do the hard thing this never-to-be-written page in our glorious history. Who has the last word? The first. My task is only to repay my debts, give credit where credit is due, leave the book open for all to read what is brought to light. In the beginning, I say, in the beginning. Thank you, Lou. And now it is my privilege to introduce our second poet. Sheila Black was born in Minnesota. Her father was in the US Foreign Service. And while growing up, she lived for spells in Brazil, Paris, the Bahamas, Senegal, and the United States. She graduated from Barnard in 82 and later received an MFA from the University of Montana where she studied with Mark Levine, no relation, Greg Pape, Patricia Godeke, and most memorably, she wrote me, Jack Gilbert. This I gleaned from an email after I asked her for a bio. Among her favorite poets is John Keats, as well as Hopkins, Dickinson, Plath, Villon, Rambeau, and, well, Shakespeare. She has three children, the oldest 18, the youngest 11. She is presently the poet of Las Cruces, New Mexico, where she's lived for decades and does nonprofit work. She also has a day job at a local college. She has authored three collections of poetry, House of Bone, Love Slash Iraq, and When Coy, which won the Orphic Prize in Poetry and will appear later this year. She is also one of the editors of Beauty is a Verb, the New Poetry of Disability, published last year. In her essay in that anthology, she tells the reader the sort of poet she is and why. Quote, as a poet, a storyteller, I am attracted to the unruly and confrontational elements of the confessional, to the ways it complicates personal truth through a presentation that makes the audience continually question whether the speaker is to be trusted. I think hard about why the elements of unreliability, 
the trickster aspect of confessionalism appeals to me. And I think the answer has to do with the positions historically available to the person with a disability, or more pointedly, the paucity of those positions, end quote. I read that several times before it occurred to me that while reading her work over the years, for I first read her more than 10 years ago, before she'd published her first book, it had never occurred to me that Sheila Black was a confessional poet. I still don't think of her thusly. Let me justify my own confusion or ignorance or stupidity. In her poem, Narco Corrida, a drug addict dreams of the release through drugs from all that is unbearable. The poem ends this way. River, we call it, the art of forgetfulness, fine feather on a spume of the breath. Like a kid walking a curb as if it were a cliff, or a cliff as if it were a curb. What we hunger is the fine carelessness we only arrive at sideways, as if we could dance between this world and the world of objects which lies about us. The forever stillness ebony, the hollow of the vase, the shine of light on sand, the dream of long silence. Perhaps she is indeed a confessional poet, I thought. And so I sat down and reread her book, House of Bone. Of course, almost all of the poems are in the first person, and she does bring into her poems the enormous difficulties of her growing up and her young womanhood and her later, her adult womanhood. But there is no alcoholic, suffocating mother nor an abusive, lecherous Nazi, Nazi father, <laughs> nor siblings elbowing her out of the way in a scrimmage for appetite, to quote Delmore Schwartz. But if she says she's a confessional poet, who am I to say she isn't? The question became, why did I have to reread the book to discover the obvious? I believe I was too distracted by her social concerns, by her heightened sense of the need to be useful, to be truly moral in an immoral time. Perhaps I was too distracted by her ability as a storyteller, a narrator, her concise and compassionate writing, too distracted by the resourcefulness of her language and a certain subtle halo effect she could bring to her imagery so that the simplest objects, a twig or bud or fig or hand or mustard flower or garden hose or comb, seem to have been pulled back from the brink of eternity. Perhaps I was distracted by the daily lives of all those fictive characters that crowd into her work, or the actual ones who find a second life in her poems. Those powers, the power of language, the power of story, the power of music, and the power of imagery altogether told me her work was utterly authentic. In her essay, she made much of her design as a poet to make the reader question her trustfulness. In that regard, she failed me, for I never for a moment doubted her authenticity. Please welcome Sheila Black. I don't know how I can live up to that. Um, it's kind of great that I think I'm a better poet than I am an essayist. And um, he just called me out. I have so many people to thank, but I want to begin with kind of an odd thank you. Um, I got here two days ago and promptly needed a root canal. I have the shakiest teeth in the world. They're kind of cantilevered and delicate. And I have a dentist that's my parents' dentist, Dr. Maria Nichols. And I said, I'm supposed to read at the Library of Congress. And she introduced me to a Dr. Um, Solnit, Mir Solnit, and her assistant. I want to thank Dr. Nichols, Dr. Solnit, Yelena, Liz, um, and um, Elena, who were her assistants. They ran me back and forth between two offices. 
he kind of looked at my teeth and I saw him pause visibly. And then he said, you're lucky, I'm a great lover of poetry and I don't have as much time as I'd like to read it. So this is my way of supporting poetry. <laughs> And then the man had nerves of steel. He proceeded to do a very difficult root canal. So to him, I give my, my greatest thanks. I also want to thank the Librarian of Congress, James Billington, um, who is such an articulate and passionate advocate for the power of intellectual history and intellectual life of our country at a time when I would have to agree with Lou Askoff, it, we really need it. Uh, we seem to be in a kind of an odd era. Um, I also want to thank um, my co-prize winner who just gave a fantastic reading. <laughs> I sat there thinking, now I'm honored and humbled and I know what a bad writer I am. <laughs> and I want to um, thank my family who are all here. Um, I want to give a shout out to the co-editor of Beauty is a Verb, Mike Northern, who drove down from Philadelphia to be here, I believe. And if you're not here, Mike, well, he kept texting me he was on his way. And I want to thank most of all Philip Levine. In fact, I want to start by reading a poem I did not intend to read tonight, but I was thinking as um, Phil spoke, he has no idea how much I learned from him as a poet. Um, from before I went to graduate school, when I was kind of in my own house with a new baby, uh, I was over 30 before I began to write poems seriously. I was in my house with a baby, a uh, crying baby, um, trying to figure out how to write poems, and I read Philip Levine's books over and over again. And I feel as if he was a poet who taught me to feel, but also how to react on the page, how to, how to have a lively kind of interchange going on with the reader. These were all lessons I observed, and there's many poems I could point to, but I'm picking this one because it's kind of a public poem. And this is a poem, frankly, whenever I think about it, I think, oh my God, I never could have written this poem without Philip Levine, though I don't even think he's ever read it. And uh, it's called Hell. Sorry, Phil. <laughs> Hell. And it, it's from my second book, Love a Rock, which is a little more novelistic than my first book. It's about a woman living in Paris, remembering when she lived in Paris and knew people who were veterans of the Iran-Iraq war. And she's thinking about this war that kind of vanished from public notice at the time of the current, when the Bush administration was going into our most recent war. And I think I was concerned with how Wars happen and people forget them, but there's sort of a way in which you can never account for the individual history and loss of people. Um, I don't know how you do. This poem's called Hell, Phil, I'm sorry again. This is the joke the old men tell. You begin in the mountains where the sky is a chill cream, and as the clouds burn off, the blue turns clear as the fires of heaven. You drive past mountain orchards of plum and peach, white blossoms, pink blossoms, down through narrow valleys, threads of water, until the earth on either side turns a seared color and you open the windows, feel the breath of the engine. And when it is almost midday, the tar on the road melts under your he wheels and you pull a handkerchief from your pocket, and you wipe your forehead and say, this must be hell, and this is how you know you have reached Iraq. Another day, another cafe, a woman at the next table was complaining about crime. The thuggish youth had taken over the streets. Time for the police to show some backbone. An elderly woman in a seal coat, her delicate coffee cup printed with her lipstick like butterflies landed all over. You said, in my country, there is no problem with crime, ever. She said, how is that possible? You said, the police discover the cafe where the criminals go and you made your hand into a machine gun. It works every time. She turned her back. You laughed too loud. No, you said. It is unbearable in truth. Once I used the word innocence, and you laughed in the same way. That is too rich, you said. 
holding your stomach, innocence, ha, ha, ho. Um, I was really, I meant to thank more people, uh, especially Stephen Schwartz, who is the represent, is the uh, foundation of officer for the Whitter Binner Foundation, which funds this fellowship and has the added advantage of coming from my home state of New Mexico. Um, I felt like it was one for the home team. Uh, and I want to read a poem about New Mexico. Um, I live about 40 miles from the U.S.-Mexico border. And there's a town called Columbus that is right on the other side. There's a town called Palomas. Um, and uh, the two towns are kind of sister towns. And I, lately, the borders had a lot of upheaval. But this is about, this is about Palomas. Here, at 3 o'clock on a Sunday, only the bars are busy. Men step out squinting into the winter desert chill. Dirt roads littered with boulders the size of eggs. And the boy in the watchman plaid shirt, torn out at the elbows, unfurls a hand for spare change. Our eyes are all red, as if we have been downing white liquor, screwing up our mouths to absorb the healing poison, the curled worm at the bottom of the glass. Why is everything so old here, the five-year-old asks. Behind us flow the smooth tarmacs of America. Ahead, roads billow up like clouds. How can I tell her how you pick up a stick, draw a line in the earth, and on the other side, nothing is the same? A gringa of 16 makes an angel in the dust. She is stoned on tobacco and rust-colored wine and on the sky, which rises here forever. This place is a stop bottle, the US customs man says. Everyone here just wants to cross over to the other side. And I picture a river of clear water. And I, a, I picture a river rushing down a crooked mountain. The petrified colors of the rocks frozen blues and reds, colors of the blood in the body, above the scent of creosote and sage. Whoever said this life right here is not enough was the beginning of the poison. Under my feet, glass splits into leaves and blades. A can flashes like a wound. Even the Coca-Cola is cheaper, someone says. And at the pharmacia, there is a line which staggers out the door. Um, I've been writing a lot. The book that I've been writing currently is um, about New York City. And I, I spent my entire 20s in New York City. I lived there in the 80s. And um, I, the book's called When Croy, which is New York backwards. <laughs> it's kind of obvious. I thought it was such an original title, and then I Googled it, and I found it had like 300,000 entries. <laughs> and I thought, okay. And there was even a character called When Croy on some kind of Annie Mae show. Um, but I remember, I think that it's one, you know, Washington's a great city, too. And cities are kind of fascinating in the sense that Great cities are like great libraries for the young. You go there and you learn so much. They're also kind of like huge machines. And New York is, is sort of the biggest machine of them all. And I was kind of fascinated with the idea of um, the way cities are kind of composed of, um, of dreams and there's also the real city. You never quite live in the real city. You always live somewhat in the ideal city. And um, this first poem I'm going to read from, I'm going to read about three poems from this book. The first one is called um, Broken World, and I'm dedicating it to Grandmaster Flash. Does anybody remember who that is? Uh, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five were a rap group in the 80s, and he, uh, he sang this song. He, he, he had a big hit called The Message, uh, and the chorus was like a jungle sometimes. It makes you wonder how you keep from going under. And I heard this wonderful thing about Grandmaster Flash. He was very kind of socially conscious for an early rapper. But I heard this wonderful thing it, 
about him that when he was a teenager, he invented the machines that we they now use to sample voices. And he did it by breaking into all these vacant lots in the Bronx where he was from and stealing radios from cars and little pieces of machines from wherever he could get. And I thought that's kind of like an Edison invention. You know, he invented the sampling machine, which is a way, seemed a very poetic invention, a way of sampling little pieces of songs or voices. So this poem is called Broken World. It's kind of my valentine to Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. On the streets, we find needles and soda cans, bags slashed in bright red, shaking in the wind. And when the train rocks by, there are names, which at a distance look like magnolia or barbed wire, tags that move like sound on the eye. Perhaps it begins by him thinking about how nothing is clean, virgin, untouched. He does not know this is what he thinks, only that when he tries to be still inside himself, he is conscious of that swelling, pieces of voices, scraps, leaves, squares of broken glass, he scrubs his little cousin's high chair until the kitchen is dark and still the tracks of marks, fork tines, spilled food. Soon he is breaking into the vacant lots, limboing under the electric fences past the chained dogs, where in the split front seats of wrecked cars, he dismantles the silent radios in his lap, chrome boxes bursting with colored wire, broken hearts out of which he will build a new body, a machine that will speak for all of them. Um, this next poem, When Croy, is based on a true story. Um, I used to hang out a long time ago. I had kind of a wild youth, I'm beginning to think, as I go through these poems. But I used to hang out in a bar in the Lower East Side called the Mars Bar. And it was kind of a local art gallery. And all these people from the neighborhood would just come by and bring art. And, when, and I knew the bartender, so I would help hang the shows sometimes. I was never a painter, but I knew some. And one day, this guy came in. He was a janitor from a nearby building. And he said, can anybody just bring in stuff to, to hang up on the walls? And everybody said, sure, bring whatever you've got. And he came back with these manila envelopes that contained draftsman pictures of New York block by block. Um, but he was doing New York backwards. And if you hear the poem, you'll hear why. Um, and he hung his, his stuff in the, in the bar. It's called When Croy. For the show, there was Hamlet and John Dufresne and you, painting on the backs of doors, on the pieces of the dismantled organ from down the street. And that guy, he was just a janitor from a nearby basement, carrying a hollow cardboard tube. No one knew what to do with him. We offered to buy him a beer or a vodka and tonic, but he said he didn't drink, not anymore. And I am passing over the stories within stories. Lynn, the red-headed bartender who said you were the kind of guy she might kiss and forget in the morning. And I always thought you did kiss her in the black painted bathroom, grimed glass, silver scarred letters, couples that didn't make it. Some girl calling some other girl, you slag whore. And a bar like that can be a secret world, always nightfall, wherever you enter. The clock on the wall never reading precisely right, so that we too felt we might stretch out into some other space or time, up all night, feeling the burn of our throats faces painted and repainted by passing cars. He held the tube right up close. There is no simple way to help this story escape. It lives in the tunnel which smells of paper. 
When the show was going up, Lynn cleared off the bar, and he pulled out the reams of crackling draftsman paper, translucent, checkered, with sky-blue lines. When Croy, he said, was where we lived, now and forever, alongside this city, the one where his daughter died hit by a yellow cab, the streets moving in reverse direction, the buildings even the same, but subtly rearranged. He had only reached as far as East 7th, rising up from the Hudson block at a time, eternity to trace the span of the bridges, the slow ooze of the polluted river, which too flowed in the opposite direction, a kind of mirror, bizarre, incandescent. The bar time did not change. The walls did not resolve into any other shape, much as I wished it. And in our tenement, a hundred blocks north, the painting count kept rising. Battered wood and stray bits of canvas, cardboard squares propped against walls covering floors, base pigment, red, yellow, blue, cars and street lights, what rushes up and through your madness like a reflection in the simple knife used to slice bread, the ordinary, the way it shimmers, uncontrollable at the edge of perception. And I didn't love you. I didn't love you anymore. Um, I, my family was not able to come because my kids are all in school and we just couldn't rig it. And they all take school very seriously. I have an 11 year old and a 13 year old. And, and my 11-year-old gets straight A pluses this year, and she was very proud of it. And she said, if I come to DC to hear you read, I might get an A minus. <laughs> <laughs> and she plays trombone. She's a pretty neat kid. And she's also a very, very sensitive kid. And um, this is a new poem. I've actually, it's not been published, I, and I've never read it before, which is kind of like walking without a net. Um, but it's for my youngest daughter, Eliza, and it's called Sensibility for Eliza. My third, I'll start again. I feel like I go too fast sometimes. Uh, this is for my third child, sensibility for Eliza. My third child has inherited the ailment, the private, problematic view. She wonders about herself in relation to the day, the wind, I am afraid she will never grasp the simpler tricks of happiness. The poet who writes of blind Orpheus, why only one music maker about among us? Which would make more sense to me if she wrote, why only one music? My daughter broods, spoils her supper. Along the acequia, reeds bend in twilight. We feel the bats stir, that all but imperceptible mouse-colored motion, scissored wing that seems to move beyond mere mechanics as they're singing, more like the creaking of a half-formed machine, seems more essential than any mere song. How else will they ever find their way? How else will she, Eliza, trailing behind with her worried frown and the trees which she calls her companions, the deer she glimpses behind the passing car, hunted, run ragged, who she swears wears her name. Um, I've written a lot. How, how am I doing for time? Okay. I've, I've written a lot of poems that in some ways, um, well, they're inspired by my long marriage. People always think that family life is not the stuff of great drama. But I think that actually most of us experience, I always feel that, um, I always feel, for example, that Wuthering Heights, if it was ever filmed, should be filmed as a kind of black comedy. 
Um, you know, because whenever you see those films of, of Wuthering Heights, they're always kind of boring and lugubrious, you know, and everybody's saying awful things to each other and it's terrible. Whereas family life often, I find, you go from extremes of emotion in half an hour. Like you love your husband dearly, then he reloads the dishwasher for you as he always does, or he tells you you didn't put out the garbage correctly and for a brief moment you hate him passionately and then he makes you tea and you love him passionately again, <laughs> you know? And the same thing with children. Um, so once, this is another new poem, and um, uh, my husband is, is, he studied philosophy and he's much smarter about that kind of thing than I am. And so whenever we get in arguments, he usually resolves them by going into some long philosophical explanation about being in consciousness that I can't follow. And one time we were having a fight and um, he said the thing that is the sort of main line of this poem. Um, and, uh, and the poem is called, These Days I Go By the Name of Blank. And, and it's to my husband, Duncan, who I wish could be here, because he would have liked it. Uh, love should not have to be a murder, you tell me. For days, I ponder what you mean. Behind every story, another, or each word shutting out what might be. When I loved you, I said it was because you knew how to chainsaw a cord of wood, fix our creaky wood stove, read the calls of the birds hidden in the far trees. Sometimes I don't know if you are that person anymore or if I am, the one who waited at the end of the logging trail all afternoon while you climbed to the peak. Love should not have to be a murder, but too often it is. We cling to history as to a chain of beads, each one counting down this and then this. These days, I go by the name of, what would I save if the house was burning? These days, I go by the name of, too much water under the bridge. And yet, the strange sweetness of some mornings a mist above the frozen grass, the V's of ducks traveling miles for a split of water. Perhaps the only name worth having is do over or revise or the notion of the story you tell. Each time you change it just slightly. The girl opens the door to fetch the water. The girl rides the donkey, an arrow flies through the trees. The fairy tales I tell our children all have this one thing in common. The forest is large as is the world and the child goes out and no one knows where the path will lead. Love should not have to be a murder these days, I go by the name of the path not. These days, I go by the name of wet leaves on the window. The name of here are the bright ghosts in all we see. Um, I'm just going to read three more poems. Um, this next one... I is I have a bunch of animals. I have two cats, three cats, one outdoor cat, two cats, and two dogs. And a couple of years ago, I was driving in this kind of desolate highway with a coworker. We used to go to these communities in southern New Mexico called Colonias. We did a lot of work. And this thing came across the road, and it was a tiny puppy, and it was half dead. It was tiny, tiny. And I was going to take it to the shelter, but I had to pick up my daughter from high, junior high, my oldest. And that was the end of the dog going to the shelter. Uh, so the dog came home. It was tiny. We fed it with a bottle. And this dog kept growing and growing. And it turned out to be a wolf, Irish wolfhound. <laughs> and this poor dog was the most lovely personality, but very traumatized. It had been dumped out of a truck window and left. So it was, it was the most destructive dog I have ever known in my life. It ate all my shoes, it tore down the curtains, it knocked over my dining room table, it broke the dining room table. It just did a whole bunch of things. And I had these friends, uh, she was a librarian in NMSU, 
and she and her husband took the dog, and the really tragic thing is they got divorced a year later. Uh, but that was happening before, and the dog was eventually adopted, I hope. <laughs> they, they, and they had gave the dog to this rancher in uh, northern New Mexico, wh who, w my kids, by the way, had named this dog Wubby, and the rancher renamed it Guinness, which is a much better name. And years later, I was at a party, and the dog kind of spotted me across the room and came running. And I'm not one of the huge animal people of all time. I like animals, but I'm not, you know. And it came running, knocked over the table of all the food, and got to me. <laughs> and I wrote this poem. It's not really about the dog, but I was thinking, this dog used to kind of break my heart, because all it really wanted was to be loved. But every time it tried to jump on people or lick them or do anything, um, basically, all hell ensued. All, you know, all hell broke loose. The poor dog. So, uh, and I thought that's so human in a way. You know, this desire to be completely open to the world that ends in difficulty. So that's what this poem is. And this poem is for the dog, who's Wubby. Um, and it's called Little Grief. I feed you warm milk from a dropper. All night, whinge and moan. You make a lousy guest. Shred the furniture, piss on the rug. The neighbors gaze at you askance. But I can't stop listening to you whistle in and out. Like the conversation the river has with itself as night burbles on and on. Song that might almost be a silence, large as a gift, sparkly, as a tree in ice. And why do I believe chill makes the world a glass? I resist believing in the accident of origin, the grain in the shell around which a shimmering globe takes form. But I can picture so clearly the, act, the mess of your birth, the floor of straw, the slick around a body, why I clutch at you, my purse of pens, my sack of ash, little grief, little grief, who is ever cherished enough? I think a lot about the problem of being happy in the world. It should be so simple, and most of the time it is. But it is paid in our, in our cultural life sometimes to, wh what do you do to live a good life? Not in the sense of a productive, successful life. We get a lot of attention to that. But what do you do to live a life of, of, of a strong community, a happy community, a caring community? Given that we're all such difficult people, or at least I am, I feel like sometimes I'm the, the big malcontent existentialist in the room. But it's something I feel that is important in what poetry does. Uh, I've thought a lot about what poetry does without coming up with any answers. Poetry does nothing. But I think that what poetry often does is it is a kind of fellow traveler. Wherever you're at, a poem can meet you, but also give you some imagination to do a little better. Um, and this poem is a very simple, small poem. It's about, again, New Mexico. I feel like for the Schwartzes, I have to read a lot of New Mexico poems. Um, and it's basically about living in my neighborhood in New Mexico and happiness. And it's called, um, and I'm going to mispronounce this horribly for all you Italian speakers out there. It's um, linguini estivi, which is summertime linguini, which is a great thing to cook if you're ever in the mood to cook. It's spaghetti with raw tomato sauce. So linguini estivi. Bad Pecans are falling out of the trees. The wind whips the dust into heady clouds. Our basil plant is dying, but the tomatoes they sell in the farmer's market are still local, small, sweet, and perfectly ripe. I dunk them one by one into a pan of scalding water. Their skins split and shrivel in seconds. I strip them naked, rich red hearts, dice them, mix them in the big ceramic bowl with a golden swath of olive oil poured from the tin, 
minced garlic slivers and the basil, the last of the leaves washed and torn in rough pieces, a recipe old as superstition, as the proverbs linking love and hunger. Lacan claimed love originates with the desire for a mother's milk, the warm curve of the breast, the pulsing nipple. A mother's milk is thin and blue and sweet. The sauce I make is red and gold with oil. The taste of these things is surely heaven enough? I repeat to myself, I am happy, I am happy in this kitchen at dusk, sweeping the dulled linoleum floor, the big dish on the table with its taste of sun, this world of richness, how can it never be enough? I lay out bowls and spoons and forks in the eerie blue light. Flies buzz close to ground, slowing as the chill approaches. My son is laughing in the next room. My daughter is breathing hard, imagining herself a princess menaced by intruders. My husband is leaning against the back door, looking out at the backyard where shadows of cats crisscross under the shaggy trees. Thank you. I'm Rob Casper, uh, and before we um, open up the drapes uh, so you can see outside and we open up the doors over there for our lovely reception, and most importantly, before we open up the door to the balcony so you can walk outside and experience the city at dusk, I would like to present the 15th Witterbinner Fellowships in Poetry to L.S. Asikoff and Sheila Black. So please come on up. So please buy their books, uh, hang out, get some food, and uh, walk outside. Thanks so much. And uh, we have um, some information on uh, future programs coming up. Our poet laureate is giving his uh, conclu giving the concluding uh, event of the uh, a year on um, May third. So please come back and um, hope to see you soon. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.